Mic check. Mic check. Mic check. Mic check.
I think we'll go ahead and get started. I did walk around the room and say hi to folks. Um, so th this is being, this is really loud, it seems like, but this is being live streamed. Jason Cox is helping us pull that off. And um, we need to, when you speak, you just need to push the button on your mic so that the green light shows. And that way people that are watching this remotely can hear what you're saying. Um, and so it looks like, I think maybe we move one mic over um, and everyone has what they need to be heard. So appreciate that. Um, so just to make sure everyone knows you're in the right room. Uh, the intention, this uh, meeting is to uh, talk about the draft Western Oregon Forest Management Plan that we've been working on uh, for a few years now. Um, so we're happy to have a draft out and we've been spending this some time the last couple of months reaching out to the public and seeking input and trying to answer questions. So this is the last of those meetings, um, although there still will be a couple of weeks uh, for you to answer, ask questions and, and submit comments as well. And we'll talk about that more towards the end of the meeting. So that's what's going on today. And our intention really is to give you some grounding on the draft forest management plan itself, introduce you to some of the materials that can kind of um, help you understand the intent of the plan and um, lay out the process that we're going through in our work with the Board of Forestry, which is our governing body for all things to do with policy for the Department of Forestry. That's the intention for today. And I thought we could start off with introductions. And so I have gone around and said hello to everybody, but my name's Liz Dent and I'm the State Forest Division Chief. And my name is Rod Kramer. I'm with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Mike Wilson. I'm with the Oregon Department of Forestry. My name is Roger Negebauer. Um, live in Arch Cape, Oregon, rural Clatsop County. I'm not a forestry expert. In fact, I grew up in North Dakota where two trees and a Sage put stand is considered a forest. <laughs> but I am a citizen of Oregon and live across the street from a proposed clear cut. So I have a tremendous interest in your plans. My name is Colette Hayes and I am the chapter president for Oregon Equestrian Trails Northwest Chapter. My, my name is Art Poulos. I'm an organic farmer in Sio, Oregon. I'm Bob Pendleton, a retired English teacher, high school English teacher. Mike Tody, West Oregon District Forester. Good afternoon, I'm Brian Pugh, and I work for the State Forest Division as the Deputy for Policy. I'm Jason Cox, Public Affairs, ODF. And I'm Justin Buttress, uh, Policy Analyst for the State Forest Division and also the Project Manager for the Forest Management Plan Project. Okay, great, thank you all for that. So I don't know if folks have had time to really dig into the plan. Um, so I will just take a few minutes to walk you through how it's organized um, and some of the, and then introduce you to some of the materials that were at the back table. Um, after that, we're going to kind of um, step through a couple of the key pieces or sections in the plan and use that to um, sort of have the conversation, uh, answer any questions. Uh, we'll be taking notes uh, to capture any comments that you want us to consider. Um, and so that's uh, how we're going to organize that time today. What I do want to let you know is that <clears throat> we'll be taking this draft forest management plan uh, to the Board of Forestry at their April board meeting. Date is 21st, 22nd. It's here in Salem, and they're going to spend a full day just on this topic. 
And so what we'll have for them is we will have uh, completed a summary of the public comments that we've received. And we'll be able to take some of those comments and fold them into the draft forest management plan. And, any of the, and we'll indicate that. And if there are comments we have not been able to incorporate, we will uh, highlight those and, exp and have an explanation as to uh, why we haven't been able to fold those into the plan. So really trying to be really transparent and track what people are saying and help the board understand where the public is and what you all wanna see of these state forests. So that's the main thing that's gonna happen at that April meeting. Um, and like I said, that's a full day for the Board of Forestry. There's a little bit more context I'd like to give you today. Um, we are simultaneously working on what's called a habitat conservation plan. And what a habitat conservation plan does is it uh, is an agreement with US Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marines Fisheries Service, so two federal agencies that have jurisdiction over listing species as threatened and endangered. So an agreement such as the Habitat Conservation Plan characterizes commitments that the agency would make for conservation on these lands and also characterizes and gets a commitment from the services on what type of harvesting can take place and where it would happen on the landscape and those sorts of elements. What that does is simultaneously strengthen conservation and provide assurances to manage uh, these forest lands. Without a habitat conservation plan, we're managing these forests and protecting threatened and endangered species using what's called a take avoidance approach. And what that means is instead of having this broad um, agreement that covers all of our lands for you know, multiple decades, um, instead of doing that, we're looking at every harvest unit by every harvest unit, evaluating and surveying to see if there are threatened and endangered species. If they are, if they're there, uh, we adjust our um, harvest plans accordingly and we work with the services to make sure we've got something moving forward that they're supportive of. That um, is, can be effective, but it is not really efficient. Um, and, it, and we are um, not able in that framework, uh, we're not really able to look holistically at all the species um, at one time and think about the entire landscape over very long periods of time. So there's a real benefit to having a habitat conservation plan to have that long-term look. Um, and so that's one of the reasons we're pursuing that as well. That's a multi-agency effort, <clears throat> both federal and sister state agencies. Um, and so some of it ends up um, sometimes being hard to predict to know how it's really gonna play out. And so that was the idea behind the fact that we're also continuing to draft a forest management plan that uh, would be used uh, without an HCP. So the, the plan we're talking about today is the one that would be used with take avoidance simultaneously working on a habitat conservation plan. We'll be bringing that to the Board of Forestry in October. So when we go to them in April, we will have done all of this work. We'll lay it out in front of them. We'll have an all day discussion with them around what we've heard, how we'll receive input from them on how they, uh, you know, how they are looking at the plan, what they would like to see. But ultimately what we're asking of them that day is to take the forest management plan, this work, and put it on the side burner so that in October, when we go to them in October, they have both the HCP and this plan to look at. So they're not, we don't want them to make a decision in April without having a full look at another approach that would include an HCP. So it's kind of um, uh, um, def things, while the efforts have been parallel, the FMP, this work we're talking about today, and the HCP, they've been parallel for a couple of years now. They're really coming together this year, uh, which we're really excited about. The uh, last thing I'll say, and then I'll stop to see if there's questions on this, is that if the, if we even if we continue working on a plan with a habitat, let me put it this way. If we continue working on a habitat conservation plan in October, if the board says, yeah, keep working on that HCP, 
it, we will use much of the work here to create the companion forest management plan that goes with the HCP. So an HCP describes conservation and um, uh, forest management and um, protecting species, et cetera. The companion forest management plan uh, speaks to recreation, cultural resources, air quality, scenic resources. So that's why we need them together. And so a lot of what's in here would be paired with that habitat conservation plan. So I'll pause there and see if there are uh, questions. It's the One thing that um, struck me from your remarks, and maybe I'm wrong, but it feels like a lot of the HCP mm -hmm. is driven by federal requirements. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you noticed, but the federal government is currently walking back most of its environmental protections. So I'm hoping we're not guided solely by federal rules and regulations, because if the feds pull the plug on federal on species protection like that, I'd like I'd like to see Oregon standing tall and you know preserving those those environmental concerns. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I would say that well, first of all, we've been at this for a couple years, and so we're fully committed to the conservation that needs to happen on the ground, and that is being informed by our work both with. Uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, Rod Kramer's here with us today, but also with the uh, terrestrial biologists and the aquatic biologists from the services. And so I would say our focus is squarely on what those species need for conservation. Yes. Did you have a question? I was just gonna say, I, I agree wholeheartedly with that. And I fear that, uh, things could get pretty sticky with the uh, federal government and wonder what resources uh, ODF has to combat that. And as he said, stand tall. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Bob. Um, <clears throat> we've brought a lot of resources to the table. So we've hired a consulting firm to uh, do the heavy lifting on putting together the habitat conservation plan. They have tremendous amount of, amount of expertise on writing HCPs for in other states, et cetera. Um, so they bring a lot of resources to the table. Uh, we've also contracted with a facilitator and she and her company, uh, Kearns and West, are really helping with those conversations with our technical experts to make sure we all are um, you know, getting, uh, achieving the shared goals. And she's also helping, uh, we, the way we've set it up is we, for the HCP, we have a technical team and we have, and then we have a steering committee. And the steering committee has leadership from the state and federal agencies. So um, she's helping with that as well. And that structure itself, I think speaks to the questions that you're asking. We are, uh, we're aligned with those organizations and we feel a strong sense of commitment among the state and federal agencies on this project. Um, and then we also have a, a group called um, Oregon Consensus. And so we've, con we've um, contracted with them as well. And their expertise is really around um, creating um, a, a shared sense of objectives and um, vision, if you will, and the agreement and alignment uh, with our stakeholders around how we're gonna be proceeding on the HCP. So really trying to tackle it from all directions. Uh, definitely we've been talking with the services or, and, and also keenly aware of those changes that are taking place. And I would say that um, not only are we bringing the resources to the table, but the services and uh, our sister agencies, OSU is also helping DEQ, DSL, um, are all fully committed to making this succeed. So I'm, I'm actually feeling very optimistic about it. Great, that's encouraging. Thank you. And, and I would just add, I'm, I'm representing the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, and, and I think we share some of your concerns, quite honestly. Um, we, I personally have not seen that trickle down effect to the region yet. Um, yeah. And I guess in that respect, we 
do have a very good working relationship with federal partners at this point. Um, and then again, sharing your concerns um, with some of those pushbacks at the federal level, the state has undertaken some litigation to push back uh, on the Endangered Species Act and the, the, the Federal Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Mm -hmm. So I think we, we see some of those same issues and, and we're trying to do something about it in that, in that respect. Okay. And I'll just uh, chime in a little bit on that as well. Um, <clears throat> one of the things to kind of put the framework sort of in the right place between the FMP and the HCP and that sort of thing is the HCP is essentially a compliance mechanism just for the covered species in the HCP. And so for us as a land manager who already has species occurrence on our land, it's either take avoidance of shifting sites or a more planful method to provide for species. And that's really the agreement that we're looking for with the services. Um, and I totally echo what uh, Rod is saying. You know, we've, we've dealt with the same individuals for many years and we're not seeing anything terribly different at the local level with what we're negotiating currently. Um, <clears throat> but when it comes to providing wildlife habitat for native species and aquatic and rip properly functioning aquatic and riparian habitats, it really all goes back to the plan. So the HCP, the FMP, because the HCP will provide, have specific strategies to provide for covered species, but the FMP is gonna be a lot more uh, encompassing. And so there will be certain constraints uh, with an HCP that get enforced on an FMP, but the FMP is still going to be broader than that. Okay, great, thank you. It's good discussion. Uh, I've got just for you move question. on I, I, those. Oh, um, sorry. Go ahead. I, I just got one question. How, how, when these two plans are presented to the board for them to evaluate them, do you provide some framework or some tool for the board to go through? So their decision-making is transparent. So when they're valuing compromises and turning down certain elements of the plan, is there some framework or some mechanism you, you are suggesting that they go through so we're able to understand their compromise and evaluations? And is that part of the process that you've thought about or does that manifest itself in the plan? Great question. Uh, I'll take a stab at it and then um, uh, Justin or Mike, I'd say, could weigh in. But um, we've had to adjust our work plan over time in terms of what we could do and get accomplished by April. And we, um, so at the April meeting, we will, we aren't ready to lay out that comparison and sort of the um, how does this plan differ from the current plan and how would, how, and providing, as you said, a framework for the board to kind of look at trade-offs. Um, so that's one of the reasons we're asking them to put it on the side burner, that we feel like we need to get farther along um, on the HCP, and then we can start talking a little bit more around the pros and cons of different approaches. So, so that's one thing I would say. Um, the second thing, and, and it's part of one of the things that we, um, why we're, sort of um, proponents of the, of the draft, the changes that we're making, um, is that we've embedded what's called measurable outcomes into the draft that would be the tool for doing those trade-offs analyses so that the policymakers really understand if we're doing X, then that's gonna mean there's a change over here. The policy decision is how do you strike that balance and where do you wanna land? And that's exactly a Board of Forestry um, decision space. So does that answer yeah, your question? I think from a public's perspective, I mean, at least from a personal perspective, that's the problem with this decision-making. Yeah. You have these plans that have conflicting outcomes and conflicting priorities, and they go to the board and the board makes decisions, but their decision-making is not always transparent. And we're, the outcome cannot, their, their, their decision-making cannot always be judged because they are internally making these priority decisions for themselves. Yeah. And that's not always apparent to the public. What are the trade-offs? Right. Why are they being made? What are we sacrificing by going down certain different routes? And what, especially for these long-term plans, yeah. you know, everyone has a different final outcome. Right. And so I, I think part of the plan, or at least part of the process, 
should include this transparency framework or tool that allows the public to judge the board's decision-making and at least make it transparent. Really appreciate that. And I, I guess um, I never want to speak for the Board of Forestry. <laughs> But what I would say is, that, is I'm pretty confident that they really value that and that that's a place that they want to be is having abundant transparency in their decision making. And we have talked about over the years, we have talked to them about a trade-offs type of an analysis, uh, whether it's to adopt a plan or a revised plan or equally important is over time to continue looking at that so we can determine if we're getting what we want out of the plan, what what are the relative outcomes? Is there a need to adjust? And so I think the measurable outcomes sets the table for that, recognize there's probably room for improvement in those, and also uh, what we're called structured decision-making, and that's in the plan as well. Again, another mechanism in that case to bring the stakeholders right into the center of what are the questions around that stakeholders are interested in and that they wanna know what the outcomes are and framing up an adaptive management trade-offs type analysis through that framework. So okay. right. really good conversation. Anyone want to add to that? Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> overall, if you look at our current plan and you look at this revised plan and this revised plan is uh, much thinner, shall we say, page-wise for sure. And it's really more focused on uh, a process and a construct around ecological forestry versus structure-based management. And by saying that, I'm not saying structure-based management uh, is bad. It is ecological forestry in and of itself, uh, different terminology from a different time. But this plan focuses more on really trying to bring it up to a little bit higher level um, from the policy perspective, and then focuses in a way that the old plan didn't, uh, I'm sorry, the current plan doesn't, on, uh, on implementation and trying to get the stakeholder engagement and implementation. And by stakeholders, I'm talking about everybody from our county partners uh, through all of our uh, the normal interest groups that uh, we engage with uh, down to as much of the public as we can possibly get interested in, in what we're doing. And to really have more of a robust process around there and having the focus of <clears throat> having the goals and the measurable outcomes associated with them really translate through the adaptive management plan into uh, digestible sized implementation periods under the plan where we can really set some more concrete objectives that we're more comfortable with because we're dealing with a more finite period of time. We take a plan and say this might be around for 150 years. It's hard to set very rigid standards when we don't know that that's all that's necessary. Uh, and then we have to go back and it, it becomes somewhat of an onerous process to make the adjustments. Whereas if we focus things into the implementation level, perhaps we run out a decade of saying here are the goals and objectives that we're trying to achieve. We have a good, really good idea of where they'll be because we can plan fairly specifically for 10 years, say, and then also what are the monitoring questions that go along with that? And there's an end to that where, you know, we wrap up a monitoring cycle. There's reporting out. People understand what's happened. We understand um, <clears throat> the effects that we've had and we can make adjustments at that point. So at that, in that way, it becomes a plan I think that everybody can can get their head around a little better and we can really adjust in a better way to what uh, whatever the current conditions are politically socially and uh, with our forest have the mic close enough proximity Let's see if I can pull it off I think this conversation might be Better supported with a graphic. Looks like we're figuring how to do that along with, there we go, is that it? Yes. And that's being streamed as well. Yes. 
So just picking up on what Mike was saying, and I think it does provide a good basis for make sure we're all thinking about this the same way. What the meaning, the purpose of this graph, and it is in the draft force management plan on page 122. What we're demonstrating in this graphic is the different planning and implementation levels. And for us, so when we say implementation, it's probably self-evident, but it's really where the rubber hits the road. Like, what are we actually doing on the ground? And we think about the forest management plan and the implementation in different temporal and spatial scales. Um, and there's different uh, people responsible for decision-making depending on where we are there. So this um, starts off sort of, if you will, above the dotted line is under the discretion of the Board of Forestry. So under their discretion is the document we're talking about today. It's the forest management plan. If we get an HCP, it would be the HCP as well. What that means is the board ultimately goes through their decision-making processes and in a transparent way um, and ultimately approves um, a forest management plan. The plan guides our thinking uh, over the long term, and in this case, and it covers multiple acres. So in the case of this document, it's about 650,000 acres. It's all of our lands west of the Cascades. And so, and then it's meant to last, you know, a couple decades, ideally, 10 to 20 years. Uh, if it's written the right way, the hope is that it really stands the test of time. So long time frames, long spatial and larger spatial scale. And then this box just shows you what's in the forest management plan. And these, these are required by law to be in a, or by Oregon administrative rule to actually be in the plan. So you can see the list there. I won't read through it. I think a key thing here is goal strategies and measurable outcomes. That's really the, I think the meat and potatoes of the document. Related to that are performance measures. And that's a, a, what we're characterizing as a small set of metrics um, that speak to the goals of the plan. And so right now we have three, six, nine, ten performance measures, three for environmental benefits, three for social, three for economic, and then we have a tenth one that deals with financial viability. And so we report, although we haven't been doing it for several years for a lot of different reasons, the setup is those are linked to the goals in the plan. We can report to the board on some frequency so they can, they can see, are we getting what we want out of the plan? If not, we make adjustments. And that's what this arrow gets to the adjustments piece. So below the line, these are decisions that are being made at different levels, either the state forester or some level in our Oregon department in our state forest um, organizational structure. And so I'll, do, I'll follow this arrow down first. The first thing is the implementation plans that Mike was talking about. Those are typically written at a smaller scale, say in, in by our one for each of our districts and intended to last at the most around 10 years. Some of them are modified more frequently because we learn things. We learn more about the landscape, around the species distribution, um, around uh, ecological function, it's you know, forest conditions, et cetera. And so we need to make some adjustments in how we're gonna implement the plan. Those plans are signed by the state forester. So you can see the decision-making comes down. Then we scale it down even more to what we call operations plans. Right now, we write those annually. We're thinking maybe there's another time scale that's better for transparency, actually, with the public, getting public engagement um, on a um, possibly on a longer time frame. But that gets down to, 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 to much more specificity. Where are we going to harvest? How big are those acres? Is it a thinning? Is it a clear cut? what sort of resource protection strategies, road maintenance, et cetera. It's very specific, tree planting, recreation, um, uh, improvements, restoration projects, it, and exactly where those are in the landscape. So there's a drilling down, if you will, in both um, space and time. All this is related to funding and that is sort of self-perpetuating. Um, 
we have a set of operational policies that, that um, have several standards in them. And, and that allows us to make uh, some changes again pretty quickly. We're making implementation decisions and uh, we need more details to guide what we're doing. The standards provide that. We also need to have a really strong adaptive management plan. And the adaptive management plan, there's a, a, a back and forth relationship with performance measures, um, and then also feeds into operational policies, which then drive implementation. If, the, if we're able to adapt and change um, and in uh, the appropriate manner, it should show up in the performance measures. If we're working down here, performance measures start showing that we're not getting what we want out of the plan. That's when we, it goes, now we need to pick up the plan back up with the board and take another look more holistically and see if there's changes that need to be made at that level. So that's the grand plan. Um, one of the things that we're doing here that we're proposing is, or a big question, we've been hearing it over the past couple months is, where do those standards live? So people uh, generally are more comfortable uh, when there are very specific standards written down. What is, what is actually gonna happen? How wide are your buffers? How big are your owl circles? How many trees are you gonna leave? Those are what we call, those are what we call standards. And so there's a conversation going on around where should those live? And if they live at the top of the graphic there in the forest management plan, it's much harder to adapt in a timely manner. We've been working as a measure of that, we've been working on this revision since 2012. So it takes a very long time to work through a process like this. Um, if we are able to um, incorporate new information from research and monitoring more quickly, then we, that should show up that we're doing a better job of meeting the objectives of the plan. That's the idea. The trade-off is people want certainty, they feel comfortable to know exactly what's happening. We recognize that. So I just wanted to be really clear, like that's part of the conversation that we're having. So I kind of dove deeper into the plan right away, but it, I, we have found over the past uh, couple months that that's really helpful for kind of setting the stage for folks. So unless there's questions, we'll kind of keep digging in a little bit. I have a question. Yes, Roger. Um, 20, 10 years, or you even said 20 years is, uh, I mean, that, to have a magic ball that projects that far ahead in these days is unbelievably challenging. Um, and to build in flexibility, that's smart. Um, one thing that I'm curious about it, in here, you talk about the use the best of science, the best science available is supposed to come into play. Um, what, to what extent is climate change and global warming factored into this plan? Because I think that has potentially an explosive impact on any plan you have if things keep, now, if it's based on the idea that brain climate change is fake science, then you're okay. Then you just go ahead with blinders. Um, but, you know, how can, given the fact the feds are pulling back on climate change, it seems like the impact of climate change is only going to build more rapidly. And that has a huge impact on our environment, our forests. Um, so predict what, how that factors in 10 years from now, I think is pretty amazing pretty challenging. How did you factor in the potential for climate change? Um, I'll do a quick kickoff and I can see Mike is ready to talk a little bit about it. But first of all, I wanna be abundantly clear that we do not consider climate change as fake science or put another way that we consider climate change to be one, the probably most pressing issue of the day. Uh, for managing natural resources. And I feel comfortable saying that because I, I think I'm also representing our agency in saying that. So I wanna be really clear about that. Um, we saw an opportunity to improve how the plan addresses climate change when we picked this up because the current plan literally has the word climate change, the words climate change one time. <laughs> and, um, 
And so uh, that's been heavily on our minds. The third thing I'll say, and I'll pass it to Mike is, um, and this is also coming from the Board of Forestry as they think about climate change in it across everything that we do as an agency is the idea that adaptation and mitigation are gonna be fundamental to what we're doing because there's so much more to still learn. A lot is yet to play out. We need to be ready to adapt and there are things we can do to help mitigate effects as well. Yeah, thanks Liz. Um, I think, <clears throat> so for us, it's, there's, there's two major pathways here with climate change. Um, one is how do we protect resources and provide for a resilient forest in the face of rising temperatures, increased drought stress, perhaps increased uh, insect and disease issues and, and that sort of thing. So there's, there's that one aspect of protecting the forest resource as a whole. Um, and then there's also the uh, sequestration aspect of it, of what can we do to help. Um, and even though that state forests uh, that we manage are only 3% of the west side land base, uh, forested land base, that doesn't mean that we're walking away from that. Um, and one of the things that we will be calculating along with our plan strategies for both the HCP and the FMP are, are carbon stocks that are stored. And, and this will all be in the forest itself. We are not uh, uh, currently <clears throat> tackling the side of the conversation uh, about what's stored in, in uh, wood products, in durable wood products. The agency is. The agency is looking into that. Separately though, at State Forest we are not. And whatever the agency uh, uh, path is or uh, direction is on that, we'll we'll be going down that same same path. But anyway, we will be calculating those those things. So it will be pretty transparent. Generally speaking, we've had a growing inventory over the last, you know, however many years. And so uh, uh, so that's good from the sequestration standpoint. I'd like to talk a little bit more about the resource protection because there's a there's the individual protections uh, uh, around uh, certain resources like streams. We are factoring climate change in as it affects, you know, obviously water temperature, um, shading and strategies like that, so forth for salmon streams um, and all fish bearing streams. Um, also with drought stress and other insect and disease pests that affect forest health, generally both for timber production, for wildlife habitat, for all of that. Um, part of that is going to be done through landscape management strategies that are going to be reflected in the plan and the HCP. And part of that is done, um, really, we've been doing it for years out at the J.E. Schroeder Seed Orchard in terms of <clears throat> our breeding program uh, for seed, for seed improvements. Breeding programs that, you know, do a variety of things, such as trying to turn out Swiss, cat, Swiss needle cast resistant. Um, trees that grow better. And now we're also looking at how we're breeding trees across uh, from south to north across these different uh, plantation stocks that we have out there to try and perhaps bring along some climate re uh, resilience there. <clears throat> and I just like to bring it full circle. I mean, I echo Liz's comments. The Department of Fish and Wildlife does not feel that climate change is fake science by any means. And uh, our commission, it really permeates all levels of the organization, our commission actively discussing it, how to integrate it into our own management strategies and plans. I know the Board of Forestry is doing the same thing. I've been involved with a lot of their work as well. So the state is very much engaged in, in trying to address climate change. The challenge is how to address climate change. And that is certainly an ongoing conversation, but I think we're, we're well aligned to, to try and address it the best we can. Okay, maybe before I jump into the plan, I'll just explain the handouts you have and then we can start walking through the plan a little bit and, and uh, have some discussions and questions. So one of them I already talked about, I think this was a handout uh, at the back table. It's also, like I said, in the plan, but that shows the planning levels. The other handout um, are our legal mandates. 
So the statute for managing forest lands, as well as the Oregon administrative rule. Uh, is that right? This is the rule. Sorry, this is just the Oregon administrative rule um, that, that establishes what we mean by greatest permanent value and how, and how it needs to be achieved or what we mean, I should say, by greatest permanent value. And that's the mandate for managing these lands. You can see it's all sort of uh, ticked through there, um, hitting on the, the really the range of um, benefits that we need to provide off of state forests. And, and I wanna do this because I'm not sure we'll get to all these handouts, um, but at least you know what's in front of you. The other one is this colorful one and uh, what this describes is um, what we're calling implementation priorities. And this also is in the forest management plan um, page. I don't have it on this particular handout. Page 123. And um, it's probably handy to have this because the color scheme makes it a little bit easier to see. But really what this is, is this is a recognition that um, we, are, we have no general fund. So our program is entirely funded through the sale of timber. Two thirds of the revenue that we bring in is distributed to the county the, that we harvested in. The remaining third stays with the agency to cover all of our operational costs, recreation, education, surveying for teeny, reforestation, all of it, road construction and maintenance. And so our ability, I'm sorry, go ahead Colette. So there's no federal funding at all, is my question. Um, we do, we are fairly successful getting some federal grants for specific projects or getting some state grants or OWEB grants for specific projects. Um, but 98% of the revenue for our program comes from the sale of timber. And there is no general fund, there's no state general fund that comes to our program which is a little unusual. People think it's a state agency, it's public state owned lands. Um, and so, so I, we always feel compelled to make sure people understand that. So our ability, we're depend on the timber market. And so our ability to fully implement a forest management plan is in part going to depend on the funding that we have available. And so we're, we think about that in a couple of ways. And one is um, the amount of money we have in our forest development fund. That's where we keep our share of the revenue. And then we do forecasts of how much revenue do we think is gonna be coming in over the next three to four years. And we wanna consider those together. And, and when we do that, uh, then we're, we've parsed out at the, when we have the best balance, a prudent balance in the forest development fund, which we think is about a year of our operating expenses, six months to a year. And if we see an increasing revenue distribution or even a steady revenue, dis, or revenue generation, we feel really empowered and, and able to uh, fully implement the plan, uh, make additional investments, expand monitoring programs, et cetera. The opposite end of that scale is our forest development fund balance is low and, there, and the foreseeable future suggests that the revenue um, incoming is gonna decline. And so then we really contract on the implementation. We may not make investments in recreation, might reduce our monitoring program, um, those sorts of activities. So we're trying to be really clear in this draft um, plan as far as what does that look like and, um, and give the public um, a, a little bit more clarity. And there I think is room for improvement yet on this, on what does it mean to be at those different levels, which we describe levels one through four. So that's that piece. And, and as we work through, we can certainly spend more time on any of this. The other document you have is uh, titled the Measurable Outcomes Workshop. And the, as we mentioned, each uh, within the forest, this draft plan, we have characterized measurable outcomes within for each of the resources that we're protecting and managing for. And so we held a workshop back in September, um, invited the public to it, just like we, um, you know, similar process we used here. And we walked through the measurable outcomes only. We didn't really get into the goals and strategies and we were asking folks to weigh, to give us feedback on, on the, did we pick the right measurable outcomes? Should they be worded differently? You know, a, a 
three or four different questions that we um, asked. We collated all that information and you can see we documented uh, where we were able to incorporate what we heard and, and where we weren't able to incorporate it and why. So, so what you can, when you see this, um, that can be kind of an indication to you on how we'll handle the information we're getting uh, on, on these, the larger plan. So you have that one. And the final, oh, you have the draft plan itself. And then the, the final piece, I think this is the final one, is um, titled Summary of Public Comments. And this, I wanna emphasize, is draft. Um, and I take no credit for this. Uh, Justin and Jason have been working on this to collate what we've been hearing so far. So we've had uh, meetings with our uh, county advisory committee. We've had meetings with a state forest advisory committee made up of um, uh, several interest groups and public at large. We've had a public meeting um, here in Salem and a public meeting in Astoria and now this one today. There's also an online survey and a comment slash question email address. And so what, Jace, what Justin's been doing is pulling all that into one place. And that's what you have in front of you. What, what we wanna share with you, make sure it's clear is that uh, I still have some notes I haven't given to Justin. So those would still need to be added. Um, and the, the comment period is open till the end of January. So there may be more that come in. We wanted to give you a flavor of what we're hearing so far and also start to you know, demonstrate, here's how we're capturing what we're hearing. I think that's it for the handouts back at the table. Did I miss anything? Okay. So uh, Jason just pulled up the um, project page that we have here on uh, ODF's website. And um, from here, there's a, a handy web map is what's kind of in the center of the screen now, where you can actually see some of the uh, resource details uh, related to our state forest lands. Uh, kind of zoom in and, and look around at uh, what might be in your backyard or across Western Oregon. Uh, and then uh, there's a link to the forest management plan there as well. It's the blue hyperlink right below the map. And then if we scroll down just a little bit more, there's the link to the survey itself. So if you haven't uh, uh, yet filled out that survey and you'd, you'd like to, uh, we have until the, the 31st to do so. Uh, we'll be accepting those, uh, those comments through January 31st. So I think, uh, are you just working on sharing that? So, uh, so that's there. There's also uh, on the right-hand side, as we're looking at the screen, uh, some other documents, um, some of the ones that are over there on the side table, uh, but then also some other documents as we've worked through this project over the past two years. Um, so, uh, and, and some email addresses to, to send in comments as well. Those will go to myself and Jason, and uh, we'll, we'll make sure that they get captured. I guess also while I have the floor, uh, Liz mentioned a couple of Board of Forestry meetings. We didn't have the dates. I have those uh, if you want to take note of them. April 23rd is the Board of Forestry meeting uh, that she referred to uh, as the initial step where the board will be looking at the forest management plan um, and then sort of putting that on the, the side. Uh, October 6th is the uh, subsequent meeting where they'll have the HCP information as well and can make more comprehensive decisions and, and should. Okay, uh, we've been at this for almost an hour. A uh, couple options I'd suggest is I could do just sort of a overarching introduction to the plan itself and we could take a break um, or we can take a break now. But it's people's capacity to sit a, a few more minutes. Keep going. Okay. And uh, at, at any time, give me, you know, the signal if, if we need to take a break sooner than, than where we sort of think about doing that. Okay, so you have the plan in front of you and, um, you know, clearly the table of contents lays out what's, um, how the different topics that are being addressed in the forest management plan. And so um, 
Chapter one being the introduction gives you um, a flavor for these lands. There's some maps, um, how they were um, acquired, um, those sorts of things is in chapter one. And then chapter two is where we begin describing a little bit more just specifically to this uh, draft force management plan. So it starts off with a vision and guiding principles. It's really important to note that we are really anchored into our greatest permanent value rule. So you have that uh, verbatim in one of the handouts. And so that's there in the, on page 72. Um, we have talked a little bit about climate change. So I thought I'd point um, out a couple things for you. So uh, actually before getting to that, uh, Mike had mentioned uh, ecological forestry and that really is the foundation for this plan. Um, it's really some of the most recent information around how to think about managing these forests um, in an uh, ecological context and recognition that that is all uh, occurring within a social political context as well that you really can't separate the people from the forest. And, um, and so that really fits quite well with greatest permanent value. And if you, in the section on ecological forestry and on page 92, there's a section in there about incorporating climate change into integrated resource management. So wanted to point that out. And then on page 93 begins a list of our guiding principles. A um, couple things to note here. One is that as we drafted these, we actually took these as a standalone part of the forest management plan. We took these to the Board of Forestry and asked for them to give us feedback and ask for their approval. And they in fact approved these as a final set of guiding principles. And we did that because we felt it was really important before we moved on to make sure that we had alignment with the board um, at this sort of policy level. Uh, the first one again is anchored into uh, greatest permanent value. And you'll see, you know, um, there's obviously a lot of other um, ideas covered in the principles. Again, thinking about the conversation around climate change, wanted to point out that principle 11, which is on page 98, um, speaks to climate change. And it says the plan will be implemented to adapt to climate change and mitigate its impacts on the management of state forest lands. It will, the plan will contribute to climate change mitigation and sequester carbon. The principles are written like that um, in that italics. Um, that's the principle itself. And then the, the following paragraphs just provide a little bit more context and description about what's going on in those. Moving to chapter three, this is where we establish goals, strategies, and measurable outcomes uh, for all the resources that we're managing, um, which are, are quite a few. Um, and so I, I would argue it's uh, fairly comprehensive. Um, so I might just tick those off to make sure we're all recognizing what we're addressing with um, state forests, so forest health, uh, production and harvest of timber and special forest products, wildlife, aquatics, landslides and roads, recreation, education, interpretation, scenic resources, access and public safety, carbon, cultural resources, air quality, plants, agriculture and grazing resources, soils and minerals, our land base in general. So that's chapter three. And I think this, I'm gonna suggest that this is probably where we're gonna spend a, a little bit more of our time today to make sure y'all understand what's in there and to really seek, uh, answer questions and seek, seek your um, input. So that's chapter three. And then chapter four is a set of guidelines. And there's a couple in there. Uh, one being our asset management guidelines um, the other one being adaptive management, research, monitoring, and that's where we have this section on structured decision making, which we spoke to a little bit when we were talking about the trade-offs analysis. So that's where we present that concept. So that's how the plan is laid out. Um, 
I think I will pause there. And, and there's a glossary with a, with a fair amount of other supporting information as well. So Mike mentioned that this is a slimmer document than we have right now. Um, the copy I have has this at about 168 pages. Our current plan is somewhere around the 500 to 550 page. So we, I mean, it sounds, <laughs> it was really one of our objectives to, to strive for a plan um, that was more streamlined, that we could speak to the public from with greater clarity, and that internally, um, our folks on the ground making this happen, or people um, that are working on related policies, can really understand what's going on and kind of get right down to it. The other, I forgot to mention, which is kind of important, driver for revising the forest management plan that the Board, established, board of Forestry established for us is that we needed to come up with a revised forest management plan that increases conservation outcomes and that increases financial outcomes. So uh, we talked a little bit about competing objectives and that's a pretty high standard. Um, and we've kept that in mind as we've thought about different ways of managing the forest. If you're at all familiar with our current plan what I would say is that this is a kind of a mar it's, it's a shift from what we're doing right now, for sure. Mike talked about structure-based management, and we can discuss that more if folks have questions. So that's a pretty big difference moving uh, to the approach we're describing here. Um, but we anticipate that with the measurable outcomes, we, are, we will be able to, to determine if we are hitting that objective, those, those two objectives. Um, and we also want to sort of control expectations that we don't really see us being able to move the needle a whole lot on both of those fronts. When we started this work, it was after the Great and Recession, really, and uh, with our reliance on timber revenue, um, we were clearly um, pre hard pressed to uh, conduct our business. And we laid off 30% of our workforce and, and stopped doing investments in recreation and young stand management, surveying, monitoring. So we stepped back and said, we need a plan that we can afford to implement. Um, and so that initiated this work. And as we got a little bit more into it, the board also um, asked that we uh, keep an eye to conservation as well and improve those outcomes. So I've done a lot of talking. Uh, I might suggest, unless there's any questions on this, brief overview, that how about a five minute break? So we'll get started at um, just in, at five minutes after two. Does that work or is that too quick for folks? Everyone good? Sorry, 10 minutes after two. <laughs> Be back now. <laughs>
Okay. Okay, so let's get started again. Thanks everyone for coming back. Um, so we've had you in the room for about an hour and we've covered, I think, a fair amount of material. So we all conferred during the break here and thought uh, we would just take a pause from talking and ask you all what you'd like to talk about. Um, if there, we wanna make sure we get to any topic of specific concern that you might have. I spoke with Kim McCarroll because um, she was, I thought she would be here, but she apparently couldn't make it. So she let me know that one of the things that I need to bring up, whether the timing's great on this at the yeah. moment or not, but um, being able to put in connector trails coming off of the horse camps and the day use areas, because if there's one trail out and the same trail back, the amount of usage is not gonna be there. But if there's at least a couple of trails, even if they go out and connect with a main trail, and it you know, overall will probably be the same footprint um, within the trail system, that gives us all kinds of different loops. And with that, there's a lot more people that will be interested in keep coming back. Okay. Specifically, um, Northrop Creek, and Sandy um, horse camps. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Have a quick ahead, question I, back for you. Yeah, go ahead. I what, uh, so we started a, a reservation system on Northrop. Have you found that to be helpful? I personally haven't used it yet. Okay, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, and we're going to have one on Sanium Horse Camp this year, also expanding that uh, reservation program. Okay, good to know. Thank that's you. That's through Reserve America, right? Is that what we're doing that from? Okay. Same one that OPRD yeah. uses. For camps. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. When Great. You're talking on your loops and understanding riding a loop and coming back to camp, how many miles generally are you? Or people wanting to ride? Um, that's a, a big question because everybody has their own. Um, it is always nice to be able to know that you can go up to 15 miles in total because um, that gives you a good four plus hours of riding and especially if you're driving very far. Yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. <laughs> I, I guess I, I, I just want to step back a little bit and think about the, um, the challenge that the board gave you of trying to uh, maximize uh, revenues or maximize financials and then at the same time this idea about improving conservation. I, I'm wondering if there should be a third element to that, which is tree health given that everything we hear about climate change and the um, expected acceleration of disease and problems within the, within the forests, whether we don't need to elevate that concern to a higher level. Because it seems to me that this um, implementation document you've given us about establishing priorities for the, uh, for the plan or implementation of those priorities is very dependent on financing. And in some ways you could imagine a scenario where forest health decreases uh, and you have this spiraling of you know, poor forest health, but uh, uh, problems in the stock market or problems from the financing perspective. And we, we land up in a spiral without being able to get ourselves out or waiting too long for the economic cycle to bounce back in order to implement critical aspects of forest health and, and tree health. So I, I, I wonder if we, by not you know, reviewing these frameworks that we're helping the board to make decisions in and, and kind of with, within our capability of implementing the plan once we have established what the revision is, whether we're restricting ourselves from really coming up with 
solutions that are going to make a difference in the medium and long term forest health. Um, we kind of learned about that with the whole Tillamook forest and replanting and planting back years ago that we're still learning about, correct? As far as replanting forests and the types of trees or where they came from. That's, yeah, so that's exactly right. Really important topic. And one that um, when we are working on revising the plan that was more in the forefront of our minds. So the original plan that, we've, that we're adapting from was adopted in 2001. And at that time, we knew we had Swiss needle cast on the landscape. So Swiss needle cast, uh, maybe backing up a little bit, um, is an um, indigenous disease that affects primarily Douglas fir, although it well affects Douglas fir. And what it does is it um, causes the tree to cast its needles in the springtime, which is when they're typically putting on their growth. You know, bud burst, you see that flush of really bright green needles coming out at the ends of the trees. Um, and so instead of going through that process in a vigorous way, it's, the trees are dropping their needles. And so it, it's uh, basically reducing or limit at some point, depending on the severity, actually limiting, eliminating growth of those trees. So it, it is significant forest health issue. The biggest issue for us is in our Tillamook district in terms of how much of the landscape is affected by it and the severity. It's largely, if, although it is a, an indigenous disease, it would be here no matter what. Um, the extent and severity in Tillamook is um, likely a result of when we reforested after the major burns in Tillamook, um, you know, it was an unprecedented reforestation effort. And so at the time they were getting seedlings from wherever they could get, getting seeds from wherever they get, huge aerial um, reseeding efforts, et cetera. And so we ended up with a lot of offsite seed that wasn't adapted um, to the, the conditions out there. And so it was susceptible uh, to Swiss needle cast. So it's, it is, um, now it's the legacy that we're dealing with. And it was really the thinking of course, was at this time after that reforestation, the trees would be online, so to speak, it would be, you know, this vigorous growth, large diameter trees, providing good habitat and potential to generate revenue. And, and it turns out that we're not there. Um, so it's a significant forest health issue as we thought about this plan. And one of the reasons that we're promoting more flexibility is, is to address things like that. We need to you know, make some different management decisions in that district uh, than we would make in Astoria or that then we would make outside Benita or Mike's district um, outside Philomath and all the way to the coast with different forest conditions. When it comes to forest health, we're thinking about that district and um, county in largely a, a restoration context with an emphasis on creating um, a productive, healthy forests. Anyone else want to add to that? A, a real forester? I, I just add, I, I like your comment and thought and just kind of, um, you know, as Liz reviewed that overall, the, the board gave us these, the twin goals is how they're referred to of trying to in, increase conservation and, and increase our financial viability there. I think, you know, where, you know, when you're talking about forest health, um, you'll see us emphasize that in the, in the draft plan here, one of the guiding principles is, is really geared towards restoration of those stands that Liz talked about in the Tillamook and other places. And it's, there's a pretty strong recognition that in order to accomplish both of those, you have to have very good forest health. And, and that's a concentration point for us throughout that. So while it's not called out and that it wasn't a goal for, uh, per se from the board, that's how we're gonna get there to meet both of those. I just, I just wonder if it should be called out because, I mean, you know, it is, it is the conservation and the financial targets there kind of a result of that tree health, unless the board has some mechanism or some reporting back or some prioritization of tree health and it's called up to the top, you know, where everyone can see it and everyone's aware of it. And everyone then becomes aware of it, how it changes over time, whether it's accelerating, whether it's deaccelerating. Then 
you know, there, there will be an opportunity to go beyond this kind of financial implementation priority framework if we see accelerating deterioration of tree health. There might be, you know, new decisions being made in different ways. But if you bury that in the plan as a, you know, something that everything relies on, but you don't elevate it to, the, to its visibility to the public and to the board, then it's less likely to become front of mind in terms of making decisions short term and long term and making bigger, bigger decisions. You know, the, 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 the challenge I think here is it's extremely complicated and there's all these different levels of plans and, and it's, it's very easy to get lost in all the details about creating paths and loops and Whereas at the end of the day, there are some real challenges ahead. And those challenges are likely to be accelerating. And having one of the key indicators of our ability to stay in for, as far as in the long term will be, will be key for the board in, in terms of informing decisions and making decisions that typically they might not be used to making. Yeah, I really appreciate the way you're framing it up and I'm looking around at our teammates here and uh, we'll definitely, I think that's a really good um, advice on how to think about our forest and our forest resources because it all tees off of that. Uh, just, you know, everything we've talked about today really is, is relying on forest health. Whether we're talking, you know, mitigating risks from insect and disease, climate change, all those types of things are all going to draw back towards forest health. I guess where I was kind of thinking about was, um, is we get lost in this discussion about making sure we have the financial resources to implement the plan. That's a key thing. We can't do the plan if we can't afford to do it. And then meeting these conservation goals and mitigating and planning for climate change and those factors, it all keys into forest health. And if we can't have healthy, resilient forests, we're not gonna accomplish any of that. So from the forester standpoint, in the field implementing those things, we think about that type of stuff all the time. I guess where I'm kind of sitting here thinking is how do we, how do we make it more recognizable in the plan or elevate it as you suggest so that people are understanding that better? I, I think it needs to be elevated. I think that's part of the problem because there are so many stakeholders here. There's so many priorities at all these different levels. There's so many operational issues of implementing the plan that can derail the plan. There's lots of different risks. Um, the environment's changing quickly or at least unpredictably. So unless you elevate a key indicator, a key leading indicator of future success, which I believe tree health is or some version of that, then it's very diff difficult as a board member or a decision maker to, to really evaluate the impact of your current decision making. At least even be able to track whether your current decision making is having the desired long-term effect. So then you land up being subject to stakeholder pressures because the, the ultimate goal, which I think very few people will disagree with, I mean, without the tree health, as you suggest, is... I mean, there is no Department of Forestry. So I, I think without that, elevating that key, that obvious key indicator, you, you get lost in all these details and negotiations and compromises and all these financial frameworks that tell you what level of implementation you're allowed to undertake just lands up being handcuffs. I mean, there should be mechanisms to fund uh, tree health and long-term health of forests that sit outside of this very nice, easy, simple framework that allows people to make decisions in one hour, but might be undermining the strategy, the plan, and the future health. So yeah, I think it's critical. I think it's more important to have that very clear up front than all the details in this plan, no matter how well thought through this plan is. I think with, without that sitting at the top, we're, the board is visibly able to monitor that in some, some way. And then, of course, there's challenges with that indicator because there's lots of ways to establish what tree health is, but I'm sure, I'm sure it can be done. 
I don't know if you've had an opportunity to really um, spend some really quality time reading through this draft plan here, but uh, if you look through, you know, I would ask that um, look through those performance measures because that will be the indicator about, you know, if, if we're in agreeing that uh, it all begins with forest health, the products and outcomes from that will be, that's where those measurable outcomes and, th and that'll be the indicator there. And that's what the board I think is going to look at um, as we look at adaptive management and those types of things. If we're not meeting something, what do we do to tweak it to move differently? Uh, I would, uh, if I can throw in the anecdotal comment here without Liz throwing something at me, we're never going to be absolved from those other conversations that you're talking about, those pressures uh, from groups or the board making those social political decisions. That's just part of public forest management. Um, and so it's kind of incumbent on us in the field to take that, um, take that direction what we have, but focus on those things that are going to make us successful in the field. I, I still just wonder if these outcomes are clouding this leading indicator, which is tree health. I just wonder if, you know, when these outcomes are reported to the board and to me, the, the tree health is more of a leading indicator of future sustainability and that should be front and center. I, I want to try and think of another example, but I mean, there's plenty of examples in business where you measuring outcomes of what employees are producing and you're measuring their efficiency and effectiveness but no one ever sits down with the employee and say, oh, are you happy? What's on your mind? What's your concerns? And um, so I, I, I think just having that tree health buried in all these other outcomes that are dependent on implementation of certain things and are very regionally based and differ by forest and differ by kind of tree. And unless all of that information is somehow collated and elevated to this indicator that the board goes, wow, We've seen the general health of trees in Oregon decrease substantially over the last 10 years. The forecast is this will continue with increasing temperatures and the new disease pressures. And this is something we really need to act on. We can't be waiting for our 150 year plan as we, because I think this plan is great, but it, it does assume some level of stability and predictability. Without having that tree health elevated, you, it's, it's very difficult to incorporate all this new information and risk and factors that might be changing more often or more regularly than we used to. Um, I'd like to say that, for example, when we go out and work on trails and stuff, we, we clear underbrush as needed. We work with the forest as we're told how to do it by ODF and so forth. So even though we ask for trails, we are also working to help keep the forest healthy because it's important to us too. This is a great discussion, uh, definitely taking it to heart. And one of the things um, that I did wanna point out while we're on the topic of forest health is on page 99, that's the start of our a chapter on goals, strategies, and measurable outcomes. And in fact, forest health is the first section of that. So it's the first topic. There's a little description there around um, what the indicators would be for forest health. Um, and then it's a pretty simple section, a um, couple of goals, but it has 11 strategies. So definitely, uh, you know, at least in terms of numerosity, starting to show the complexity of it, and then a handful of measurable outcomes. So there is a section there. Um, it does start in the goals and strategies section. A point wanted to point you to that. And then there in our resource assessment, there is a forest health section. Someone may be able to get to it sooner than me. Um, now I know this doesn't necessarily address the, um, the comment art that this needs to be front and center, but I did just want to uh, point these out to you. Okay. So there's uh, there's some information in there, and we talked about Swiss needlecast, but 
um, in this section, uh, uh, there's a pretty good assessment, I would say, and treatment of a full range of um, insects and diseases that occur on our forest land base. And then a, you know, a recognition of some of the disturbance events, um, uh, drought being a key one that are gonna intersect with those diseases. <clears throat> Yeah, I would just add that it's a uh, it's no small coincidence that we actually start with forest health. That's um, it's a huge part of how we think about uh, this plan. Uh, ecological forestry, kind of at one of its base principles, is hedge bedding or bed hedging, however hedging that goes. Your bets. Hedging your bets. Yes, thank you. Um, so you know, it's a it's about no, recognizing there's uncertainty and there are risks, and we don't necessarily know. Uh, what all of those things even are, but there's going to be a, a dynamic uh, system at play uh, anytime you're talking about ecology, uh, whether it's forest or some other uh, ecological system that's going to be at play. So uh, there's a pretty good discussion starting on page 75 about incorporating uncertainty and change and managing risk to resources uh, where we, we really kind of get into a little more um, detail about what we, what we mean and that's one of the reasons why we're really also promoting uh, adaptive management in a in a big way with this plan, um, and um, and adopting the structured decision making process as well. So uh, the other thing that I would add is on the uh, graphic that that we uh, had up earlier um, that shows the the different planning levels and that sort of thing. Jason's pulling it up now. Um, which is on what, page 122, I think. Yeah, 122 in the plan, that, that guy there. You know, I think one of the things I'm hearing is as we're thinking about how to report key metrics to the board, forest health needs to be a performance measure. It needs to be one of the things that's in this box here where we're talking about um, <clears throat> how does the board evaluate the plan performance as a whole and, um, and I, I think what I'm hearing is this for you is number one. Forest health is number one, and then we get into those other things. Uh, and, and that's a critical element uh, for the board to always get an update on as we go through and evaluate the, the ongoing performance of this plan. Yeah, I, I just think the, the board's challenge to you all should be how do we maximize the financial health from the forest, how do we conserve the forest better and how do we ensure the long-term uh, long term health of the trees? And the, you know, so then you'd be optimizing three elements to the strategy. You, forest health would not, not be buried under these other two measures, it would be called out. And clearly if you are trying to optimize tree health or forest health, you, you might have a different approach to then the conversation, a conservation discussion, which includes many other things like wildlife under the trees and age of trees, and and that would include very different things like you know financial measures. I mean that is fundamentally different approach. If you were just working on forest health, you might not have all old growth forests. You might have stage forests or basically what your plan calls out, but it's not pulled out as a separate objective in creating the strategy or revising the strategy. And that might put a different spin on some of these outcomes that you're hoping for. Um, I'll, I'll start off if you don't yeah, mind. So, do um, just um, thank you, Dodia, for allowing this meeting to take place and inform some people. That's the reason I'm here today. I want to be a more informed citizen. I have my own special interests in the forest as well, but I'd, I think we'd be hard pressed to find anyone that doesn't put forest health at the top of the list. My problem is if I want to be an informed citizen, I don't see anything in the forest management plan that allows me to measure the performance of ODF. Um, Liz, you've talked about the embedded measurable outcomes, but they're all minimize or maximize. And I think each special interest is gonna define that minimum or that maximum at a different level. 
So my challenge and just wanting to be an informed citizen is like, how do I measure it? And even on page 122, where you, you've got the dotted line here, I know that there's some operational policies, the standards there. Do we as the public have access to that? You've talked about 10 performance metrics that you use, but there's nothing in the forest management plan that allows me to look at your 650,000 acres. If I see next door to me a thousand acres being clear cut, it's sad, but maybe 649,000 acres are gonna be healthier because of it. But there's nothing in the forest management plan that helps me become an informed citizen. So I, I didn't put a question in there. <laughs> My question, I guess, is how can I be an informed citizen? How can I not just respond as I get lambasted from news blurbs by different special interests all the time? How can I be comfortable with my ODF board? Mm -hmm. uh, so there, yeah, I, a couple things that I would say, and again, I invite others here around the table to add on. Um, first of all, your statement around the measurable outcomes being framed as maximize and minimize being you know, maybe not very helpful, I'll say. Um, we've heard that before. So you're not alone in that. And we're taking that to heart. And when we go to the Board of Forestry in April, we're going to have a little more, we'll have some more information to say, here's some other ways to think about it. So we'll have, we'll, we're going to be responding to that concern um, here over the next few weeks as we frame up some ideas. I think that, um, not that I, th so the notion around the measurable outcomes is that a subset of those, because there's quite a few in here, that a subset become performance measures and that those are the ones that we use to talk to the board. And you're right, we, you know, we have some right now. And our thinking is that once a revised plan or an HCP is adopted, that we need to make sure we have the right ones. Um, so, th so there will be more transparency. There will be transparency around that and what those are. So in terms of measures, that's, the, that's uh, the intent and goal there. And by reporting on those, that's the way to answer your question uh, that we can inform the public on what's happening. Um, in the, so that's just the performance measures and measurable outcomes. There is this uh, process called uh, structured decision-making. I'll let Mike talk about that. And that has, uh, that's centered around public engagement. And so we'll get to that in a minute. And the third piece I would offer is, um, and you know, Jason Cox, he's our public affairs person that works on state forest stuff, is we do struggle with how, what is the best way for us to engage with the public and better, as you put it, inform the public and also you know, hear back from the public on, on what we're doing and what folks are interested in. So uh, I, think there's a lot for us to learn about how to do that. We've got different mechanisms that Jason uses to get information out and to seek input. So we're definitely looking for ways in general, beyond just this in general, to be able to better engage with the public. Did you want to speak to that? Yeah, so <clears throat> the first to speak a little bit to the measurable outcomes construct as it's presented at the, at the plan level. And it's, it's kind of a weird thing, you know, maximize, minimize, and essentially it's something you would like to see, a condition, you know, how do you know you're achieving the goal? Well, then you would see these things in a directional sense. And a lot of them, you know, not only do they not have hard targets associated with them in, at the plan level, the force management plan level, they also, you know, some of them are at least seemingly diametrically opposed. Maximizing wood volume available for harvest and maximizing wildlife habitat. And so <clears throat> the reason we went down that road and approached it that, that way is uh, we did want to have something there for the, to, to be able to say whether or not we were meeting uh, a goal to have a reason for the standards to exist. You can, or strategies and standards to exist. You, you create a strategy to get somewhere and you, you have to ask yourself why, what do I expect to see at the end of it? 
Um, the reason to keep it generalized and in one direction was basically to try and not constrain the stakeholder conversation, at least at this level. And in terms of, well, I want wildlife habitat and to try and keep st individual stakeholders and groups from trying to enter into the optimization piece of balancing all those things. And that's a tough thing to do because even when we're trying to have the, this, dis we were trying to have this discussion initially months ago with some of the people who are very familiar with what we do. And immediately they're into the optimization piece of it because that's what they've been doing. And that's how they've been used to engaging in the conversation for a long time. And so it was, it was pretty frustrating for them. And we really want to be able to divorce uh, the optimization from understanding what folks want, realizing at the end of the day, the optimization problem, while we are going to in, engage stakeholders in that process for sure, in an ongoing way, it's on us. That's our job as forest managers is to figure that stuff out, right? So, so there's that piece of it. Um, but to talk about the, and I'll just get up here for a minute and try and carry this thing with me. Um, <clears throat> To get to the structured decision-making piece. Um, <clears throat> huh? Oh, okay. Yeah, so the, anyway, when we, as we move from clarifying the decision context, uh, essentially that's a space where we, where we start with stakeholder engagement in the implementation of how this works. And, <sighs> The decision context, there will be general sideboards set by the forest management plan on that. I mean, there's certain places that we can and can't go. But then really, this is, this is the big part of it, where we take the measurable outcomes and we apply those quantifiable targets to it to come up with what I think of more as objectives for a specific implementation. And I think Objectives are, uh, are those things that people are used to seeing in, in a lot of federal plans, for instance, and they're very specific and targeted. Um, however, those plans are also a lot narrower in their temporal scope, you know, than our forest management plan. So the implementation plan is kind of where that happens for us and things get a lot more specific. And then getting stakeholder involvement, all these orange bubbles are where stakeholders are really involved in the process. And so we're developing alternatives to test. Here are strategies that might work for a given implementation. And then ODF goes back and does the modeling and other analysis necessary to estimate the consequences of that. And then return the results of that analysis uh, into the stakeholder arena to evaluate those trade-offs and select the options. And then again, it's ODF's responsibility to actually implement the plan uh, and, uh, and monitor the results. And then the cycle starts over again. So a lot of the specificity that folks are looking for is really gonna happen here in the implementation. And it's, it's kind of a strange place to be having to wait on that. Um, um, until we get to an implementation phase. I think the, the main thing with the measurable outcomes is they set up the types of things that we wanna measure that we can uh, have specific, very specific measurements for during the implementation. So, and, and also while I'm on the subject, <laughs> to talk about structured decision-making, we are talking about a very facilitated process. We do not know what the stakeholder group will look like for this yet, except that we intend to be comprehensive in our selection of individuals to represent on that group. Um, we have some, we have some, uh, we have a state forest advisory committee currently that, um, provides us feedback on operations and it's a really successful group because they're really rolling up their sleeves and getting into what we do and understanding. And they're providing us feedback in that, in that context of our operations. And this would be a similar sort of thing, I think, 
And I think once people get involved with it, they'll really be able to, to do that same thing to really be, really be engaged in a meaningful way. And uh, anyway, the, the whole schedule around this group, how often during an implementation plan that we get together and uh, you know, be updated on monitoring information and, and other, inf other information that we bring back to them. It hasn't all been decided yet, but it would, the concept is an ongoing group that would, that would go with this implementation. We, um, we hired a consultant, natural resource consultant, to help us think about adaptive management. Um, and so this structured decision making is actually, uh, it's being practiced in other places and really considered um, sort of a more textured approach to adaptive management. Um, and um, considered to be more successful, likely to be much more successful than kind of that traditional adaptive management approach where decisions kind of um, go into a black box and kind of come out the other side and things may or may not change. So the hope here or the vision here um, is to have real clarity around what it is that matters to our stakeholders because they're helping drive what it is we even want to um, measure and consider. Um, and keeping that engagement all along the way so that what we're doing is really reflecting what people, what the stakeholders, public, um, and counties expect us to be doing. For just a, a minute, um, Randall, I thought I would go back to that question around standards and not, does the public get to see the operational um, policies? And those are, we have a set right now it's a thick binder. We have policies, operational policies for just about everything we do, road construction, maintenance, surveying for owls and murelets, salvage harvesting, whole litany, and those are publicly available. So were we to, if that's where the standards were going to live, if that's where the real specificity lived, we would need to, uh, we would be committed to really elevating that to public, um, you know, uh, review, make sure the public sees what's going on, understands how the uh, strategies would be implemented more specifically with, you know, buffer widths around streams and wetlands. By way of an example um, of our current plan, a lot of people feel like this, revi this re proposed revision um, is losing detail of the current plan, but the truth is the current plan doesn't have a lot of detail either. It has a lot of words. <laughs> <laughs> um, it does have very detail, a lot of detail around stream protection and wetland protection. And it sets some targets for the percent of the forest that'll be in different forest structure. Um, in, those are in ranges though. And then it has some guidelines around leave trees, snags and downwood, meaning what do you leave in, a, in an area that you're harvesting for that kind of type of legacy structure? So there's not a lot there. Um, to use owls and murelets for a moment to, you know, really obviously um, relevant threatened endangered species on our forest land base. The current plan says, we know we have them and we're gonna look for them and then we're gonna protect them. I and mean, I'm obviously being a little glib, but that's basically how it's framed up. The how we look for them and the what we're gonna do is in the operational policy. And that's a good thing in this example because it's been changing during this whole time. And it's largely changing in response to um, things that we don't control, it, it, specifically where the federal agencies are and what they expect to see on our land base. So if all that were in the forest management plan, we would have had to have been changing the forest management plan every time a policy changed at the federal level. So that's just um, an example of how we handle some of this stuff right now in the plan. The, this is a repeating theme, a concern around where the, those details going to be. I talked about that a little bit in the opening. And so our thinking is to, when we come back in April, we'll have an example. Here's an example of an operational policy for streams and wetlands. This is how it, all the detail, here's what it would be. Okay, Board of Forestry, if you wanted us to pick this up again in the fall and continue working on this, you have some options. Here's what the public is saying. You could, we could have those live as an operational policy. We could take all that detail and, and put it in the plan and it could be back in the plan again 
Um, and there's some other options to think about it um, as its own standalone set of um, administrative rules, Oregon administrative rules. So there's some ways to deal with it or uh, folks may be comfortable once they see how this could work with ha those standards being in the um, operational policies. Um, my my uh, question has to do with um, the whole question of uh, the carbon sink and um, how you what this there's a lot of conflicting science um, about the carbon sink whether mature trees or young trees um, sequester more carbon you know how much is in the wood products and in the roots and all that stuff. Um, what kind of, how do you decide on which science to look at? And um, because it's very important, not only just for the state of Oregon, but regionally. I mean, I've heard that um, um, our Western Oregon forests um, really sequester more carbon than uh, the Amazon per hectare or, you know, measure, unit measure of ground. And, um, and so it's, it's really valuable, especially with the Amazon burning and everything, all the other wildfires going on. That, um, um, you know, we, we have some metric for being able to measure that carbon sink, whether we're going up or down on it. And um, obviously growing more trees, that's always gonna be positive, but are there things we can do about the way we, we do our harvesting so it's sustainable harvesting as opposed to clear cutting, which has an effect on water and soil and, and, um, and landslides and all kinds of other things. And all of those have costs associated. Um, so we're already you know, adding more and more costs because of the climate sort of thing. Um, um, so what I, I guess I'm asking is, um, how are you going to measure that carbon sink and what what scientists are you pulling in on, on that, answering that question? Um, and the other question has to do with the financing part of it. I mean, I think you've done a really lovely plan here. It seems very well organized. It's easy to find things. Um, and, but, it, but again, it's a high level plan and, and we understand that. Uh, it has to last for a long time and then you can get, get into the weeds and do the flexibility at the, at the lower end. Um, the finances is, is very difficult for you guys because you have a very, your, your timber harvests are, 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 are main, making how many people you can apply, can, can do the work, you know, invoice the bills and all that stuff. Uh, and that's a very hard position, hard position. So I'm thinking about what other external sources other than the um, general fund might you find to, um, to um, be able to, you know, hire hire staff, you know, sufficient amount of staff to do the work that you really want to be doing, and are there things such as looking at, since everybody cares about, you know, the forest fires and is under threat of their house burning or smoke inhalation and all the other stuff that's going along with wildfire and, and climate stuff. How about looking for private um, investments from, or changing laws so that um, uh, insurance companies who are a stakeholder in this, uh, they have to pay, pay out a lot of money when the uh, house burns down. What if, what if premiums went just to wildfire fire prevention and everybody pays into that thing and it's, then it's not so much of a burden on any branch or any department or any, um, the general fund, there must be other ways to pull in private involvement in, um, in so that the, you know, to address the climate and to address the forest. I'm sorry I'm so long-winded about this, but I don't know how to simply, it's, it's a big picture is what I'm concerned about. Well, the, that, those are uh, really important conversations. Um, I think what I'd like to do is take a stab at the carbon piece first and again invite others to weigh in here. Um, a couple things that I would say is um, 
with the force man draft force management plan and the guiding principles and the notion of carbon importance of climate change and carbon sequestration is certainly um you know throughout this draft plan we've heard people would like to see more and so we'll definitely be looking at that but recall remember that you know we are just one division of three divisions three operating divisions in the agency all of which are under the policy direction of the of the board of forestry and they are tackling what is their, they want to be really clear around their policy around climate change and carbon storage. And they're going to spend some time working on that. So in a way, I would say State Forest in terms of setting policy statements is a little bit ahead of the agency as a whole. I don't want to overstate that because each program and division in the agency has some pieces of climate change that they're considering and working on. But in terms of establishing a, a policy statement, I think we're a little ahead of the game there. So it's really important for the Board of Forestry, in my view, and we talked about this at their January meeting, January meeting, to, to, to take over the leadership of that again, and that everything we do then is anchored into what the agency as a whole is saying. And I'm confident that what we're doing is, is consistent with how the board is thinking about it. They just need to be able to kind of put it on paper. One of the things that's informing their decision, which goes to your question a little bit, is um, the, they've, there's been um, a carbon storage and flux report on, uh, in terms of what's being um, sequestered, stored, and, and leaving the forested systems. So that report was just completed and it uh, measures all the things that, that you just listed off and it characterizes it uh, by landowner and some other metrics as well. So there's a analysis of state forests in there and how much carbon is sequestered and stored, I should say, in state forests. Where can we get that uh, report? Uh, it's gonna be on the Board of Forestry meetings um, link on our ODF website. It's usually where we can't, can't we get past, can't the public get past meeting materials from Board of Forestry meetings off yeah. of our website. Um, but we can, uh, Peggy, I think we have your information somewhere. Maybe may make sure you leave a card for us and we'll, and we'll make no, sure I'm you Josie. get it. I'm sorry? I'm Josie. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. I'm a subset of Peggy. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've said that too many times now. Um, I'm, I'm pretty new to this topic. I'm brand new to the topic, but I okay. report to her. <laughs> okay, so we'll make sure we get that paper to you in case it's hard to find on the website. So interesting thing about that is State Forest is actually um, storing more carbon than the other land bases in Oregon. With that said, we the agency recognizes that there needs to be more data collection on State Forest. We're a pretty small land base, and so there needs to be what's called a densification of plots on state forests. And so we're working uh, with another program here in the agency that's really taking the lead on the climate change and carbon topic to get more samples on state forests so that we can track that. So I'm gonna pause there and see if Brian or Mike wanna to add to that. Yeah, sure. Um, so what, what we are doing is we are uh, we are always improving, uh, trying to pursue forest inventory improvements. And one of the ways that we're doing that uh, is we will be employing some new technology around inventory uh, that's been evolving for, you know, a decade now easily uh, around <clears throat> LIDAR uh, uh, remote sensing. Um, and using partnering with uh, the Forest Service uh, FIA uh, program. And so that's the densification of plots on our land that Liz is referring to. And it'll, it will inform our overall inventory. So it will help us better report on everything from habitat metrics to timber volume to, um, <clears throat> to carbon and be able to do it in a way that is consistent with uh, the way others are, are reporting it. And we are, you know, we don't, we don't do a whole lot of our own in the state forest program uh, division of our own carbon analysis other than calculating what we have. The methodologies and, and all of that behind it are uh, resources planning folks do and our partnership and planning 
uh, shop and they partner with uh, FIA directly more on a analyst to analyst level to, to figure those things out. So we are trying to integrate with the overall effort so that what we're reporting is consistent with what other experts are, are reporting. Oh, okay. Yeah, for, for folks who don't know, uh, FIA is an acronym that for, stands for Forest Inventory and Analysis. And that is a nationwide system across all ownerships that the forest, uh, well, Forest Service is in charge of implementing it. USDA is in charge of implementing it. Um, and they have plots out there that I think the native plot grid, one plot for every 6,000 hectares. So it's a very large scale reporting system. And in order to break, depending on the size of your ownership, in order to get meaningful results, you might have to densify that. But anyway, it's it's a, it's a federal program that's longstanding and ongoing and and robust. It doesn't show any signs of going away anytime soon. So it's reliable. Uh, speaking of inventories, is there any old growth trees on ODF land? Absolutely. Do you have any idea how much? Five. No. Uh, so, <laughs> um, I'll say acreage. Because, because of the history of our lands, we, we do have very little in terms of true old growth. Um, we have very few stands of old growth. Uh, you know, very few. What, what does that mean? Like so, half a dozen or? I would say probably in, in terms of true old growth, we only have a few hundred acres statewide across our ownerships. Uh, well, I, I, I'm thinking in terms of a FEMAT definition, uh, Forest Service uh, Northwest Plan type definition that people have been using for quite a while, which would be a stand of 175 years plus. Yep, generally speaking. Um, and so we have very little of that, you know, like I say, just a few hundred acres statewide on our ownerships. We have scatterings of individual old growth trees we have a policy in, in place and have for a long time that we do not cut existing old growth stands and we do not cut existing old growth trees um, except as absolutely necessary. Um, even in a clear cut situation, those would be leave trees and, and that sort of thing. We would cut them for safety reasons, perhaps might be about the only reason that we would, we would actually cut a tree that was that was significantly old. Just, oh, go ahead. Is that the same as a witness tree? Have you heard that term? Yeah, and so a uh, witness tree is, is specific to surveying and setting property corners. And those are protected by law for everybody across the board. Nobody should be cutting a witness tree. Does some of that old growth <clears throat> include uh, managed forests? I mean, forests that have been cut over 175 years ago. So, I mean, all of our stands exist in a managed or disturbed context, mm -hmm. uh, generally speaking. Um, <clears throat> it's the best way to, to answer that. Uh, our remnant trees now that we find in our stands, uh, if I were to use the Astoria district as an example, um, whereas the Tillamook was primarily burned, the Astoria district, the Clatsop uh, lands in Clatsop County were primarily railroad logged in the 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the trees there, uh, if they are larger trees now, um, they were probably scrappy trees then that didn't pay their way to the mill. Now, whether any of those individual trees are actually old growth, you know, I, um, yeah. you know, I wouldn't know on a case by case basis. But that's kind of the context, and they have a, and they have not necessarily in all cases a managed stand. Although quite a few of those stands have been thinned at some point, um, they exist in the context of a naturally regenerated stand uh, there, for instance. Whereas we have stands on our Western Lane District um, that have perhaps where we're more intermixed with federal ownerships. And there we might have more, still not large stands of old growth, but smaller areas, residual pieces of stands. 
Um, again, they had a disturbance history all their own before we got them as, as well in a lot of cases. Thank you. So the other question you had, which I didn't want to skip over, was other sources of funding. And uh, this has definitely been something we have, you said other than general fund, but I will just say we have uh, put, we pursued some general fund to help support recreation, education, interpretation. We've done that in, um, if I have my count correct, three different full sessions. Uh, our recreation budget uh, is, a, last time we calculated it was about three and a half million dollars a year. Um, and our education programs, that includes Tillamook Forest Center. We pay salaries for a few um, deputy sheriffs in various counties. So it's really rolling all that up together, recreation staff, trail maintenance, bridges, et cetera. And so we, you know, I, I think when we, when we think about public money for what we do, an obvious place for that is our recreation education interpretation program. In our minds, that's a place where we can really make a case that um, these are clear public benefits and, and um, that we can put a dollar number to. It's difficult to put a dollar number to you know, wildlife habitat, which also is a public benefit, but this one we feel like we can. So we've tried for that in several sessions unsuccessfully, but we're gonna try again this session. Um, and our Board of Forestry asked us to do that. And so we'll, we'll put that together. We'll recalculate the costs that are associated with our program and um, submit it. The last time we did it, we, um, we did anchor into the notion of public-private partnership and that um, we only asked, uh, don't quote me on it, but I think we were looking for 75% of our budget of the costs. Um, and that we would come up with other 25% through partnerships or other funds. So in this case, we could use our other funds that we have from timber sales to, to create that match, but the, really the intent was to look for some partnerships there. So the third piece I would say on the partnerships is that we've recently um, implemented a pretty significant change in how we're organized in state forests. There's a lot there to talk about, but one of the key things we did was to take our recreation education programs and bring them into one program, as opposed to right now they're sort of, they're split among districts and they each kind of have operate independently. So bringing them all together in one spot, we've added a couple positions, one of them being a, um, partnership and community outreach position. So the idea there is to bring some capacity to, go, to create some more partnerships there. And some of it may come with money and some of it may not. We were talking about the importance and value of volunteers that help us out. And that's another kind of partnership to help us get our work done. So that, I just didn't want to skip over that. And, and I would say it's, you know, we hear there are um, a lot of people, stakeholders, um, public, um, people in the legislature, et cetera, that are um, really interested in seeing us uh, be funded in some way other than by timber harvest, or at least to get some other funding into the program. It's just really hard in these budget times um, to create that. Yeah. I just add a couple of things we've tried and looked real close to at the past for other funding. And so one of the interesting things, and I think it was in 2011, we acquired the Gilcrest State Forest, which is not in this forest management plan. It's in Eastern Oregon and uh, South of Bend. So we looked at that time to selling carbon credits into the California market. And that, uh, we didn't have the authority to do that. It was not the right time. Um, according to the Department of Justice to be able to, for Oregon to sell the things into California at the state level. And so I think the environment for carbon markets a lot different now than it was then. And so that answer might've been different, but we did look at that in about 2011. 
Another thing we've looked at for several years is a fee program for our recreation. And we've decided against doing that because the cost of trying to implement and enforce that program is going to far exceed any revenue. And so that's kind of the business, you know, wonkiness of it if, if it's about revenue. But really for us, it's about implementing greatest permanent value. And if we had any kind of fee program, we recognize that we'd limit uh, certain user groups that use the forest a lot. And we definitely don't want to do that. So we are thinking through those things and have looked at it, but it, it's difficult. And so the Near-term hope is the public-private partnership, and, and we have been doing good um, at that, given our limited resources. So we think that's an avenue in the future. And then I think the third thing that worth addressing is the federal funds around the grants. And what we found, it's really hard for a state uh, natural resource organization to get federal funds to manage. A lot of those federal funds are directed to the private landowners, so that has been a difficult um, place there. Where we have been more successful is in on the recreation side from the corporations, from corporate funding on grants for trail maintenance and bridges and things like that have done well. But it's been difficult on the federal funds to get those for a state agency. Good question. Thank you. Uh, I also don't want to overlook, there's been some really generous donations that have um, come to the agency for recreation education. Um, and so, you know, we're, it's just incredible, um, the gifts that have, have come our way and we're really fortunate. And then there's some other programs we have in place to help bring in some more money um, from just, you know, the average person pushes a button, adds $5 to the recreation fund, that kind of thing. And it's, it, it's meaningful, it all does add up. I have, uh... Uh, three concerns and given time constraints i'd like to focus on one right now and that's a very selfish concern um as i mentioned we live across the highway 101 about 100 yards from the proposed north town heights clear cut um and our house my wife and i draw 100 percent of our drinking water from the proposed clear cut area as do most of our neighbors um, so we're totally dependent upon that area for house drinking water. Um, so I read the plan to see what ODF's plans are for protecting drink, drinking water. And uh, I must say the plan, even though it's 300 pages shorter, it's still not a page turner. Um, it doesn't read like Stephen King exactly, but <laughs> well, <there you> go. <laughs> got it um so what i found is this that there's not a single chapter in the 168 pages dealing with protecting drinking water there's not a sub chapter that deals with protecting drinking water there's not a single appendix that deals with protecting drinking water so then i cut to the chase i said okay the measurable objective that's that's what they're going to do all the other stuff is well, I won't say fluff, but it's just sort of building up to the measurable objectives. So I, there are 52 measurable objectives. And in two of the objectives, the word water is mentioned. But there is no single objective that talks about protecting drinking water for Oregon citizens. So I'm, I'm quite concerned about this. You know, um, our, ourselves and our neighbor are dependent upon drinking water uh, you know, quality drinking water. And, and I'm concerned whether the ODF is really um, has that as a priority to predict drinking water. I think, um, I think you have a very good point. And so I will, will definitely take that to heart and look for ways to improve the plan to address that. So thank you. And yes, it is. Uh, critically important to us and what we think needs to be provided to Oregonians. Yeah, thank you. I think, you know, our, the, the error we made is some assumptions. And so we referenced the Clean Water Act and la de la, but you know, that's just government speak for what you are saying needs to be very clear and black and white. So thank you.
I mean, there's also soils and water protection and that kind of thing. So that affects what you can do. <laughs> Yeah, and so there's a section in here, it starts on page 105, which is our aquatics, landslides, and roads. And so that's, um, you know, addressing water quality and fish habitat, wetlands, um, sediment from landslides and roads. And then there's a soils and minerals section, if I'm remembering correctly, Justin, help me out. I got that wrong. There it is, yeah, soils and, or soil and minerals starts on page 118. So there's a couple different places where we talk about that. And we can go through some of that if folks would like, but I'm, I think the dialogue's really important. I don't wanna cut off the sort of free flow, so. Uh, Roger, did you have another? You said you had a few things. So. Yeah. Um, on page 81 of the plan, you talk about a transparent process for stakeholder engagement. And I was happy to see that in there. But my experience has been the opposite. Um, again, I going back like a broken record to the fact that we live across from the Northstown Heights clear cut. Um, Three days before the public comment period ended for this, the ODF public comment period, we by accident, a friend of a friend of a friend had read about it and we found out through a chain of emails that they're proposing to get 55 acres across the street from us. And we didn't, fortunately I had time to get a comment in, but then the district director commented, well, there were no public comments, so we think there are no concerns. Didn't say it quite that brashly. Um, but the, none of the residents who abut the property, none of the people who derive drinking water from that property were notified of this clear cut decision before the period of comment, public comment ended. ended. Um, that's not transparency, that's, that's the opposite of transparency. It's, taking an action and hoping the citizens don't find out about it. That's how it was looked at for me. That's how it appeared. I mean, how would you feel if you woke up one morning and learned that they're planning to cut down, you know, clear 50 acres across the street from your house? You'd want to know about that advance. You'd like, you have an opinion about that. Um, it would have been so easy to inform our households about the clear cut. All they'd need to do is Xerox the letter pay a high school kid 50 bucks and have them deliver it on the doorstep of each of our 50 houses. It was not impossible. It was incredibly easy and it was incredibly important, but it wasn't done. So I'm concerned that other people who were impacted by clear cuts will discover it after the fact that, and I hope, and maybe when I was reading this string, a Seahawks game and maybe I missed the part where you talk about how you're gonna tell people in, well in advance when a clear cut is proposed in their area. But I, 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 I didn't feel that it was there. And I think, you know, I felt really a, a lack of trust with the Oregon government when, when that happened. And I hope that the plan can not allow that to happen again to other people. Thank you really. Um understand the where you're coming from um i ended up you know coming to astoria spending some time there uh with folks and and better understand what was going on and uh really agree that um there was opportunity for better outreach so i'm not at all going to uh, disagree with you on that and at this point, you know, the sale is deferred and we'll need to look for um other options uh because it it's not going to get any easy, you know, nothing's really going to change in terms of how the neighbors feel. And we recognize that and we'll need to come up with something different. So I just wanted to say that and, and really affirm, you know, and empathize, understand where you're, you and your neighbors are coming from. Um, the second piece, and, and uh, we will think about how to um, elevate it or put more meat on it in the plan 
But the other part of this is at the, that's that operational level as we teared down that we talked about in that graphic. And so with our reorganization, we have our operation, the planning for our operations all under one roof now. We didn't have that before. And part of the th thing that that team is going to work on is really improving the public engagement process, getting out in front of this stuff way earlier with people. So you can see what we have planned. Um, we can, we're going to kind of vet everything through sort of here's some uh, sales are going to be of, of key interest to people because of whatever might be going on there and just have a much more robust public process. Great. And, and, we're working on that part. I'm not going to, you know, we'll see. It'll probably take us a bit to get that figured out, but we recognize the need for that. Thank you. Yeah, if I could just add that, that really goes back to this implementation process where we hope to be looking at somewhat longer periods of time and to have a really good idea of where we would be going. Because, you know, for instance, if, if you had known about Norriston Heights three years before the fact, then it's more along the lines of, it promotes a better discussion, obviously, between, between you and us. Uh, and so we, we really hope to do it both by process and just by being, you know, obviously, as, as we always try to improve and be more cognizant of public uh, concerns uh, of our neighbors. Um, <clears throat> and in focusing, and being able to focus on those objectives uh, longer term, those are the kind of benefits that we really wanna, wanna be able to provide both for individual concerns and you know, also for larger process concerns across the landscape. And uh, you know, like I said, we haven't figured out what that exactly the composition of that group is. And certainly some comments on that would be very helpful to us uh, as well as, as we move forward. Um, and what about clear cuts in general? Are there alternatives that you've really looked at for your own timber harvesting? We, um, in, we do right now and would envision continuing to use clear cuts, uh, but we do, we do others, we do thinning as well. So we use a mix. Uh, we do what's called pre-commercial thinning, I think it kind of self-explanatory. We go in there and do some management to help the stelts release the stand and increase forest health and productivity. And then there will commonly be a second thinning um, of commercial value so that we can sell the trees that we thin. And then um, a final harvest. Sometimes there's an extra thin in there as well. And so there's this combination that happens just on any given stand that goes through those, those stages. And I should actually, Mike, let you speak to this question but I do want just yeah we will we do clear cut and and that's still part of our um, toolkit yeah so we talked about that earlier and, and you know we clear cut now that's one of the tools we use and that and um, the this proposed plan doesn't exclude that use of the tool um, there are places and purposes for that some of them are economic some of them are forest health related some of them are salvage related and uh, we're gonna continue to use that tool in the current plan there in the context. Uh, you get in a broader context about, can we just thin everywhere instead of clear cutting? Um, and you know, that could be a tool, that's what the national forests are trying to employ and then they thin once and then they have to ask the question, now what? And at some point in time, we're, we're looking at these are, as actively managed forests that are gonna be actively managed through time. And at some point in time, you're either going to thin to the point where it's clear cut or do it all at once. So there's a couple different trade-offs there. Um, certainly thinning has a couple of different things with it. It's more expensive to do and it produces less. And so that pot now it certainly ties us back into uh, two things in terms of what we're trying to manage a stand for and a long-term objective and the economics of it. But also just time to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, you know, I don't know what our average clear cut size is on state forest lands. I know in my district, they're probably average around 30 to 40 acres. The, the losses, you can go up to 120 acres. You see that on some industrial lands, but 
I think that would be, unless we're in the cases of Swiss needle cast or fire salvage, something like that, those are typically not what you'd see on state forest. And uh, in general, we have longer rotation ages than you'll see um, on private ownership. So uh, anywhere from 60 to 80 years old, depending on where we are in the forest. And that's interesting. That's kind of, um, you know, a, an interesting place to be because on the one hand, the public doesn't really want to see us cut older trees, but they also want to see us use uh, longer rotation ages. So if you have longer rotation ages, you're going to be cutting older trees. Um, so it's just an, uh, you know, an interesting conversation to have. I have a double-edged sword. Um, I could just add to that as, as well. Um, and Mike, you know, touched on the economics of it as well. And, uh, you know, somewhat depends on, on the times we find ourselves in. And it goes back to the forest health issue and things that we're actually able to do. Our, our biggest challenge in being able to implement any strategy uh, really is uh, where we get our funding from and how, you know, can, can we really make it pay for ourselves? Uh, for instance, a lot of our forest health issues center on the Tillamook district. It's steep, it's expensive, and the timber's not growing well, so it's not worth very much. So if we go in to say liquidate uh, Swiss needle cast uh, infected Douglas fir stand that's you know in, in really bad shape and try to replace it with something else that's more appropriate for the future. Sometimes those units don't even pencil out themselves overall, much less on the 36.25% of the revenue that we get to keep to try and cover our expenses. And so we really go in the hole that way. Um, so again, you know, I, I won't rehash the conversation about alternative funding sources and stuff like that, except to say that we are just, you know, in one way, we are just one big pot of cash. And so, you know, we think about these things in isolation, but honestly, the more money that we get to help support recreation, say, that less that we're spending out of the FDF on that, the more that we could spend on restoration and, and that sort of thing. Um, to clear cut specifically, um, you know, there's a lot of it on the landscape on, on private industrial lands. I think everybody knows that, you know, they see the rotation age, generally speaking, going down over the last 20 years pretty significantly and how those plantations are managed. Um, you know, I'm not gonna sit here and say that we're herbicide free because we're not, we do spray, but we do spray a lot less. We try to do a lot less uh, site prep than some of your more intensive industrial style plantations. And biologically what that gets us is a, you know, plantations that still realize success from a forest practices legal standpoint, they get to free to grow. Um, but we also tend to have a little more brush and uh, some more complexity. And of course our leaf strategies tend to be a little bit better. And one of the things that we found over time and, and the, you know, some of the landscape level effectiveness monitoring is found over the, uh, associated with the Northwest Forest Plan even is found um, early complex habitat, early seral complex habitat is in fairly short supply. It's in less supply on federal lands because they've had the end growth and they haven't been cutting. And it's in short supply on industrial lands because, you know, quite frankly, that's not where the profit is for them. Um, but, you know, we, we, in most cases, I think have a fairly good balance around that habitat type. Uh, just putting in a plug for clear cuts. Our clear cuts. <laughs> and I guess I'll just add a few comments there from the fish and wildlife perspective. I mean, obviously there's winners and losers out there. I mean, different stand ages and types accommodate different suites of species. So that's what really brings us to the table here is trying to find that balance. It's not easy. They're hard discuss discussions to be had. Um, certainly there's an emphasis on, on threatened endangered species. A lot of emphasis going into that and trying to, you know, get a pathway to the future that's going to benefit those older, older forest associated species. But like Mike said, um, there are a suite of species that really key in on early successional forest habitats as, as well. Deer and elk are maybe the, the focal species, but there's a lot of songbird species that focal 
that focus in on the shrubs associated with early seral forest conditions. So, so um, you know, there's winners and losers out there. That's the reality. And we're trying to, to balance those, those competing objectives. It's not easy. There's some tough decisions to be made, but we're, we're trying to address it in the best way we can. Um, are there any changes to the food plot? Um, you know, wildlife food plot plan? Are, are you referring to the forest practice rules that just recently um, got developed for, for wildlife food plots? Um, that was a new thing. Um, certainly, I think there's some, some good benefits there. And it was really in recognition of trying to address uh, some of those early forests or early seral species associates. Again, pollinators are getting big on the radar screen. How can we address, you know, those landowner objectives that want to maybe address other things than growing and harvesting trees, which is certainly the primary emphasis of the forest practice rules. And that's great. But um, this was an attempt to kind of address some of those other concerns within that framework. So, um, so I think it's a good thing we have it on the books. It's a small thing. Um, there's some interest in it, but it kind of goes back to landowner objectives. Um, and that's really where it should be, I think. Some, some people really want to do things like that, others don't. So um, we certainly have to take into consideration private landowner objectives. But the new rule does allow for, and I, I can't remember all the stats, but depending on the size of the forest landowner's ownership, a percent of that can be, the food plot strategy can be applied. And it basically releases them of the reforestation requirements, but it's only a small part of their ownership and it ha they have to describe how they're meeting those objectives, wildlife objectives. But it doesn't apply within the forest? You do, do you tr experiment with the uh, food plot areas? No. So uh, it wouldn't work. Uh, the new law would not be applied to us because our ownership's too big. Uh, I'm not even sure it could be used by state ownership. It might only be applied to, to, to um, private, but even if it, we could, it's, you have to have a much smaller ownership. Um, as far as food plots, I wouldn't say we've used that terminology. But our vision now um, and strategy for managing our upland forests and in our current plan, as well as carrying over in this plan, is the notion that we need a range of habitat types across the landscape. And so a certain percentage would always be, it would move, it would be in different places on the landscape, but a certain percentage, percentage of it would be in this early serial stage. And because of the way we, um, the way we use herbicides, it does allow for and create a greater complexity in shrubs and herbs that come back. Um, and then combined with leaving green trees, snags and down wood also provides for some of that habitat um, that when it's occurring within those younger stands provides uh, for specific species like songbirds being a classic one. But yeah, we, yeah, we don't call them food plots in the plan, but it's a similar idea. I want to say what's the percentage in the current plan of our younger cereal? And was it like 10 to 15 percent be in um, region? 10 to 15 percent of our landscape would be in that young stand age after a clear cut. That's under the current plan. And so, so that's one of those targets that we were talking about that. Uh, in the draft plan, we're moving away from, we're suggesting that we move away from those targets and instead think about it as a continuum across the landscape. If I could, I've been listening quite a bit and taking notes. And so I have an editorial comment maybe for you all to consider. So really appreciate the conversation today. Really good comments around a lot of things and really thoughtful questions. And we're doing a lot of listening and appreciate that for sure. One of the things early on in this meeting that came out and I think you all, it's clear to you all is that the board directed us to improve conservation outcomes and improve financial viability. And, and that's difficult for both. And then we got into a discussion around forest health and 
and then on to recreation trails and also on to clean drinking water. And clean drinking water is, in my opinion, kind of public health and extremely important. And so is the forest health. And really what I'm hearing you all say is talking about kind of the middle ground and not those kind of um, extremes that the board's used to hearing from on the improved conservation or just improved financial outcomes by harvesting more. And so again, really appreciate the conversation and really encourage you to come talk to our board and talk to them about forest health and about the recreational benefits that the forest provides and how important they are to the citizens of Oregon and, and how important um, public health and clean water and stuff is. I think the board um, could learn a lot from you all and would appreciate your voices in the room. Just a, um, un, you know, fleeting thought here on um, recreation and the opportunity for private um, financing, and that is to use um, your already um, great recreational centers for events that the private people could pay for for a wedding or I don't know some some kinds of uh, events that actually draw in a lot of people who are interested. Maybe they want to learn about how, har thing, how things are harvested. You could, you could do kind of um, things that could be paid for by public expense, I think, to utilize what you already have in terms of buildings and stuff. Maybe just to follow up on what Brian said is even if you can't be at the board meeting, because I know it's hard, it's you know, in the middle of the day, well, it's all day, um, uh, is you can always send in written comments. So uh, that, and um, some of the board members are really good about uh, reading those. Just wanna make sure you know that's an option. The 22nd, right? That's the next one, 22nd. So is it the 23rd Wednesday? is the actual FMP day, yeah. It's a two-day meeting, okay. so the 22nd is their normal agenda, uh, which will cover a lot of different topics, and then the second day is just this topic all day long on the 23rd. Uh, I guess just a comment. I, I'm, I'm kind of curious about how the economics work still. I mean, we have all these competing priorities, but we're dependent on the economics to provide our own funding. And I just wonder, given all these different priority, uh, priorities we're trying to maximize, whether it's realistic. I mean, we're competing against private forest owners and managers who I'm assuming are more effective and efficient, maybe not. But do we have competitive advantages that are significant in order for us to realistically compete in the long term with the, the private lands? And do we... I mean, is that the recreation, you know, we talk about recreation or these other possibilities, are the revenue streams from those other elements significant enough for us to say, uh, these are our real competitive advantages. This is what we're gonna make above market uh, profits from or value creation. And that's where we should be focusing our efforts. Or, or are we competitive with private lands? Mm -hmm. I'll start off, but then definitely invite um, others to join in here. Uh, starting with the recreation program. So we do charge fees the same, really comparable to what uh, someone would have to pay on the um, Oregon Parks and Recreation, um, OPRD campgrounds, et cetera. Um, and it doesn't cover the expenses of the program. So, um, so that doesn't really pencil out that way. Um, and again, Brian talked around us, you know, we're, we're pretty intentional about making sure that uh, folks can all have access to, to those experiences on the forest. Um, in terms of being competitive on the timber market, uh, there's a couple things we have to our advantage. One is three-year contracts. Um, and so a purchaser has, they purchase the timber sale and they have three years to go in there and harvest. And so they can really think about the market and harvest when it's the best for them. So they, um, theoretically, you know, they're paying more for our timber sales because they're gonna have that flexibility. 
And then the final thing I'd say is in some of our districts where we have, um, just because of the forest conditions there, pretty good diameter trees, pretty large diameter trees, and they're very tall. And so we have good access to the, what's called the pole market. So um, telephone poles and that sort of thing. And that's kind of a unique product uh, with our land base. So those are the things I would hit on. And Mike, do you wanna? Yeah, I guess, um, you know, in the field, I don't look at it as a competitive sort of thing. And we introduce competition in when we're selling timber sales. Right. And so, and that competition is driven at trying to maximize the revenue that we can bring in. But I, I don't see us as competing against a particular market. I think we're, um, we're adding value to markets in most cases. Um, certainly if we look at the recreation portfolio, you know, most uh, forest recreation is happening on public lands or certainly private venues where people can go. And, and once again, I don't see us as competing with those venues where more, more addition to um, the, the whole financial viability discussion comes up about looking at this, you know, trying to do this vast array of things, recreation, education, interpretation, reforestation practices, um, restoration projects, supporting the board of forestry, um, all those things that we do. Uh, it's interesting. We sell a ton of firewood cutting permits on the district every year. We charge $20 for two cords. Typically, the money we're bringing in from that doesn't even cover our cost to administer the program. People look at some folks really need that wood to heat their homes. Other folks just see it as a recreational sort of thing to go out, grab the kids, let's go cut some wood and have, fun, you know, have a fun day in the woods. So we're, it, in the end, it comes back to if we don't have a financially viable timber sale program, that's what's basically funding everything else. And as we explore these other things and other situations, you know, we have an OHV fund that we get a little bit of money for on the recreation side of things. Uh, so if you want to ride an OHV in the woods, you got to buy a sticker and, and we get some of the proceeds of that. Um, I'm wondering how folks are going to feel when they, when they pull up to the Tillamook Forest Center and it says, welcome to the Columbia Sportswear, Oregon Department of Forestry, Tillamook. You know, is that okay? Is that an acceptable thing in today's market? Those are the types of public private things that would really make a, a, a huge influence for us. I don't see us charging a hundred dollars for a firewood permit. I don't see us getting to that recreation pass thing just for the, the reasons that Brian talked about it. It, it looks good because you're bringing in revenue. By the time we share that revenue with our County partners or the common school fund or whoever financially, it gets really difficult for us to do that. And there are certain sacrifices that we're always going to make for the public good where um, other landowners might not. Um, and I think a really uh, big example of the, well, singular biggest example for us financially where, where it was tough was during the Great Recession, um, where private landowners were not selling their timber because the market plummeted. And we still maintained, uh, we still offered sales up basically to support local employment at that point. And that's the kind of thing, I mean, and that's part of greatest permanent value clearly. And so that, that kind of thing will always be a significant challenge for us. I have a naive question. Um, 95, page 95, I read that 98% of your income is from timber sales, which you reiterated today. Is that true of all 50 states or all 50 states departments of forestry, including North Dakota Department of Forestry, if there is such a thing? Are all of them supported by timber sales 100% or 98% or are we unique? Uh, so the, the short answer is no. Um, most other states are not funded through the sale of timber. Um, the North, but all the states kind of have a different flavor in what their state forests are like, if they even have them. So California has a research forest, but not like a true state forest program like we have. Uh, Washington DNR, so just north of us, they have a whole host of um, land bases that they manage and are funded in different ways. Um, so only some of it, uh, and, and most of it gets some general fund, but not all of it. So I'd say each state is a little bit different in part depending on its mandate. 
um, and have changed, they've, they've all kind of changed over time as well. But um, I don't know if, to, is that about, do you want anything to add to that? Yeah. I just remind you that when we're talking about that, that's specific to the state forest division, right? So when we look at um, forest practices, the private forest division, they're funded through general fund and harvest tax primarily and some federal funding. Our protection from fire program is, is funded through general fund and landowner assessments primarily there. So it's it, it does change from section to section, division to division in the forest. Well, it has been a long few hours and really appreciate you all being here and for the really uh, rich dialogue and ideas and questions. I think we've learned a lot and has some things that to, to think about. So really thank you. Um, uh, two things I would leave you with. Um, one is um, just our commitment to carry this information back to the board. Again, some of it we'll be able to incorporate and, and we'll be able to explain uh, what we heard and, and where we think we should go with some of that. Um, and the second piece is, um, and I was thinking about Randall's question on how does the public you know, get involved? And I will say, we have that same question <laughs> right back at you. Uh, Jason does um, just a stellar job in outreach with sending out announcements using different um, distributions to send out public notices. We have our website, uh, we'll make announcements there. I know there's three or four other things, I'm social sure media. social media. So uh, just any feedback you have on the, you know, what you think is the best way um, to reach people, we'd really welcome that. Thanks very much. Oh, um, I was just going to add into that. Um, feel free to distribute the uh, comment opportunities through your own personal networks, because a lot of times that's where we actually do end up getting a good bit of engagement is, uh, you know, you tell your friends, they tell they fr their friends and uh, public engagement on uh, land management goes viral, right? It could, it could happen. It could happen. <laughs>